Welcome to the final module of the day, module eight, file dynamics. Um, so uh, who am I? I'm, I'm uh, a faculty member in computer science and epidemiology over at Dalhousie University. I also pathogenomics bioinformatics lead for the shared hospital lab in Toronto. So a large clinical microbiology lab and collaborate heavily with many of the, well, many of the, most of the instructors, pretty much all the instructors uh, you've, you've heard from so far. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to give an overview of what file dynamics is. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of Bayesian modeling. And then we're going to talk about some of the specific kind of inferences that are can and are done using these file dynamics approaches. So uh, temporal inference, spatial trait inference, epidemiological parameter estimation, and a little bit on inference of selection. Tomorrow, you're going to get to do some of these approaches using a likelihood-based uh, set of tools. Um, particularly for some SARS-CoV-2 genomes associated with uh, zoonoses and reverse zoonoses. And I'll talk a little, I'll draw some examples later on today about that, and then you're going to be using that data tomorrow in the lab. So you want to understand the epidemiological dynamics of infectious diseases. What are your options? How do you go about doing this? So, you know, many of you have seen these before. The kind of standard way of doing this is to use case information and then use a variety of different sort of traditional epidemiological statistical models, the most common infectious disease related one being this compartmental SIR model, or susceptible, infectious, and recovered. Disclaimer that there are many, many, many more, far more complicated models out there. This is kind of the most, the simplest model or one of the simplest models. We can get even simpler, you can get rid of the recovered and just have susceptible and infectious. Um, and essentially what these models do is help us look at the dynamics of movement and change over time between the number of people that are susceptible to an infection, the number of people that are infected, and the number of people that have recovered from that infection. And there's kind of these two key parameters here, beta and gamma, where beta is essentially the infection rate and gamma is that recovery rate. So how long after is someone, when someone has recovered, they're no longer infectious. So S given time T, the number of susceptible individuals at a given time point T. And we can use a whole bunch of uh, dynamic equations, uh, differential equation, system of differential equations to model the transitions and rate of change between these groups of populations over time. So the derivative of the number of people susceptible given time by per time is this function of gamma the infectious group, the susceptible population size divided by n, the total population size, assuming a fixed population. And so how do we, this is kind of the standard set of epi tool and approaches we would take for epidemiological modeling of infection, infectious diseases. Um, but how do we actually infer yeah. these? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, how, do we, how do we go about actually inferring <laughs> this beta and gamma parameter? So we can use likelihood approaches from the case data to infer these parameters. So much like we talked about in the maximum likelihood inference of phylogenies, what do we mean by using likelihood methods to infer parameters such as beta and gamma? Essentially what we do is we can look at the number of observed case counts and we have a likelihood function where we can calculate what is the probability of our observed number of case counts given specific values of beta and gamma, infection rate and recovery rate. And we essentially can modify these values recalculate the likelihood each time as probability, and then just take the take the values of beta and gamma that maximize this likelihood, I, the maximum likelihood estimate for these parameters. So great, we have you know that's that's the introduction to you know infectious disease modeling purely from a case information, right? So why do we need genomic data? Why is genomic data useful in this process? So beyond, you know, all the things you've heard about throughout the entire rest of the course, why specific do we need genomic data to look at the dynamics and epidemiology of infectious diseases, particularly in terms of their infectious disease dynamics? So the great thing about genomics is we can use them to infer things we didn't see and haven't recorded, right? So if so, well, usually early in an epidemic, often we have a situation where our sampling is a bit dodgy, right? Our clinical diet criteria for determining whether a case has occurred where someone's been infected in the hospital tends to be undersampled. We don't have a good case definition yet. 
we're not counting the number of cases well. You know, we might have good numbers of numbers of people infected later on the later on in the epidemic, once it's been established, once people are aware of it, once clinicians are clinicians and veterinarians are looking for that and that combination of syndromes. But often earlier in an epidemic, we don't have a lot of information about the number of cases based on the case counts. So in these cases, we really we're quite often interested, though, even though we don't have information in timing the beginning of the epidemic, as well as calculating what was some of those key parameters, that beta and gamma, of which reproductive number is a function of. How do we calculate those like, key early parameters? Well, genomics, we can use genome information to fill in those gaps by looking at the evolution patterns and differences in the genomes we can try and infer some of those earlier parts in the epidemic we don't have good case counts for. Um, and even, you know, we, even this can be done based on later genome samples, even if we don't have genomes from early in the pandemic. Obviously easier if you have early genomes, but that reality is we often don't. The case information also, you know, doesn't really tell us who infected whom conclusively, right? We can do contact tracing, and that's really important and actually, you know, the gold standard for this. But even then, we're not, we're not, we can't be certain who infected who. So genomic information can be really useful for trying to unpin those dynamics and that actual transmission infection network, as well as the broader population structure of the pathogen. Cases also don't tell us much about pathogen evolution, right? Pathogens are evolving at multiple different scales. You know, within different copies of the gene of, of the pathogen genome, within a single cell infection, across different sites of infection, you know, your whole intra-host diversity, the diversity occurring between the hosts. And then for a lot of our key pathogen pand pathogens of pandemic potential, the evolution between species. And, you know, this is a key discussion now. Coincidentally, this involves cattle with the H5N1 outbreak in the US. So I told you we have the genomics lets us into some of those things that just the case information doesn't give us insight into. How do we go about actually linking genomes and these epidemiological inferences? So how do we go about doing this? So you remember from Dr. Brinkman's lecture earlier, um, the um, module earlier in the course, what we can, if we have genomic data, so here we've got A, B, C, D, E, and F, we've got five, six genomes. And, base, and we can look at we, we can look at the mutations present in these genomes and compare them, line them all up. So all of them have this green mutation. These two have this orange mutation. These three have this purple mutation. And we can use that pattern of mutations to begin to, to infer a phylogeny. So okay, so all of them have this green one. So that doesn't separate anything out. But A, B, and C have this purple one, and E and F have this have this green a uh, dark green one. D has neither, so we're going to put D on a separate branch. These two form a branch, and we can go through that pattern of mutations using all of those statistical models for sequence evolution that we've talked about through the course to infer a phylogenetic tree from the underlying genomes. But what does this tree actually represent? Right. So we got it. We got we got a pattern of mutations. We can infer a tree from that. And we get it, we have that tree, but what does it actually represent? How can we link that to the epidemiology? So what we're doing when we're sequencing genomes and then inferring a tree from them is sampling from an underlying epidemic process. So here we have a, pl a basically plot of the full, the full outbreak of this particular you know, pathogen X. So they've got person one came in, they infected this person and this person. This person then went on to infect this person. This person infected this person, and so on and so forth. So this this would be like our complete pathway of infections. That is the underlying process that, we, and what we're doing when we're taking genome samples and sequencing, is we're sampling bits of that process. So blue the blue color here represent genomes we have sequenced. What we have, if we remove the things we can't actually directly see, i.e., all the red red information. Right, we have our phylogeny. So, the phylogeny and the phylogeny we infer is a sample. It's a vision into that implicit epidemic process. The underlying thing that structures that data is the dynamics of the disease. So, what determines that underlying epidemic process? 
a whole bunch of different things, right? So uh, probably because pro later in the day, I, I won't force kind of a degree of audience participation and engagement in the discussion. But, you know, there's a huge number of forces that shape this underlying epidemic process that determines who's getting infected, how many secondary cases are being caused, how quickly are people infecting, how long are people infectious for. You know, we have vaccination status in the population. We have host migration, so people's movements between host evolution, so mutations being fixed between individuals. We have all that within, within host evolution, so diversity within the host. We have variability in infection rate. We have host immune responses, virulence factors, uh, you know, generation time. How long, you know, what's the average time between sequential infections caused by the same individual? As well as immune memory and underlying population structure of the pathogen. Many of which, you know, many of which these things, you've had an idea, like we talked about ways you can get insight into these aspects of the pathogen biology. Whether that's looking at the typing information that Dr. Deboda talked about, looking at those key effector genes like AMR genes that Dr. MacArthur was talking about. Or, and the only way you're going to be able to incorporate all this data is if you've got good contextual and metadata, such as Dr. Griffiths talked about, right? So you see how all these parts come together to give us information about these forces that shape this underlying process. And really, this underlying process is a, it's a function of both these ecological factors, the epidemiological factors, and the evolutionary factors. And so all phylogenomics is, and all of these kind of broader set of phylogeographic, phylotemporal kind of inferences, is learning about this underlying process from the phylogeny. And also vice versa, learning about the phylogeny with, by using some of this information about the underlying process. So kind of let's, that's the kind of, that's the, you know, very high level, quick introduction, end of the day, hopefully clear idea of what file dynamics is, right? Sampling the underlying process, using the shape of the tree we infer from those samples to try and understand that process and vice versa. So let's start with a simple problem, right? Let's start with the reconstruction of the transmission network. So what makes this, what, what, why can't we just directly use a tree for this? Well, the challenge of this is we have, we have comp we're co doing complicated sampling of populations of pathogens, right? So we have a within host population and a between host population. So say, here's an example here, someone gets infected, there's mutation within a host, minor variants emerge, and they, that person could then infect two other people, right? But because the infection is a subsampling of that process, we're pulling out pathogens from you know, that process. You, you cough on somebody, they get sprayed with a bunch of, say, virus in this case, which may be you know, all one variant, all one you know, set of mutation types, or it could be a combination of those types. And so in this case, you know, most of the times, the majority variant, the, the thing that makes up most of the variants, is going to be the thing that infects someone else. We build a tree. Great. We have a nice, clear phylogeny. But sometimes you can also cause an infection with the minor variants. So there's say 20% of the viruses have a different set of mutations, a different quasi-species, something like that. That can also be transmitted to someone else, right? So then our sampling becomes a lot more complicated and a lot harder to track back to the actual infection process. Um, we can also have transmission of a mixed infection, right? This person here is being affected by both these orange and these blue samples. Um, oh, sorry, one second. Uh, so, and then over time, you know, there's very dynamics. Some will disappear, others will persist. You know, our classic bottleneck where we're only transmitting a subset at a time. So we're 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 sampling we're sampling com complicated mixes on complicated mixes, and depending on the pathogen determines, you know, how much of this subclonal variation there actually is, and how much of a headache that gives to us. And what's the end product of this is the same phylogeny can be consistent with different scenarios of infection, right? So we have five copies of the same phylogeny here, A, B, C, same tree, same inference. And so in this tree, we've colored it in to try and, try and track who's infected who. And we can see A has infected B, has infected C, A to B to C, 
but potentially this this most recent common ancestor here could actually be from a sample from within C. So in this case, it would be A infected C, who's then infected B. Alternatively, we could have B infecting both A and C, C infecting both A and B, and A infecting both B and C. So there are multiple different scenarios consistent with the same underlying phylogeny. So what? How do we? How do we choose between those scenarios? Well, it's essentially the same process by which how do we choose between multiple different possible phylogenies, right? When we're doing phylogeny inference, we end up with a, several different possible phylogenies and we've got to choose between them. So what do we do? Probabilistic inference, right? We look at the data and try and infer what is the most likely tree or the higher posterior probability tree from in the Bayesian model. So, the kind of key tool in five dynamics generally is actually Bayesian inference because it gives us a very flexible statistical framework to try and deal with these complex and different scenarios and add extra dynamics on top of that. So what we're doing in Bayesian inference is kind of a quick crash course in this. So we've got some data, in this case it being our alignment of our, our pathogen genomes and you know the mutations and differences between them. We can also have other bits of contextual information, contextual data here that feeds into the model, such as traits and things over time, as we'll talk about in a second. And what we do, what we're doing is specifying a model, right, with multiple components. So what are these components? The model were what are the components of this model? Well, we have one part of the model is our underlying tree topology. What is the shape of the tree? And we can also integrate aspects like an epidemiological model. So some of those SIR, like we can directly integrate that into our model inference. What are those dynamics of infection going on? We can state an evolutionary model, that sequence substitution model. We can also uh, add in components of a mutation model. How quickly is the pathogen mutating? How does that change over time? Do we have one mutational clock, one strict clock, that all the pathogens we sequence are mutating at an equal rate? You know, for every you know fixed set of time, there's approximately the same number of mutations occurring. Or do we add more complex models where some subsets are going to be mutating and evolving faster than others, right? Such as you know, as we've seen with the H5N1 outbreak, we generally want to fit a different clock model for infections in different animals because you get different mutation rates occurring in different animals um, throughout the infection. So if we're trying to look at how date things in the past, we need complexity in that model. We need that freedom to state that. And we can also add in almost anything else to this model. That's the beauty of the Bayesian inference is we can incorporate lots of other aspects. We can incorporate immune antigenic cartography, right? The idea of how similar two different genomes, two different set of epitopes are in invoking an immune response. We incorporate spatial information right? Where are these samples coming from? How are they moving between different places? Do we have a fixed diffusion rate? Do we incorporate, you know, air travel so people can jump faster between certain areas rather than just fix spatial diffusion? So there's lots of different aspects that we can throw into the model. In fact, we can throw in pretty much anything into this flexible framework. But just throwing things into a model doesn't explain how we infer things using this model. So the key thing in a Bayesian inference is we're trying to work out what is the probability of a given model, of a given topology, given set of dynamics, given evolutionary substitution model, temp and mutation rates, given the data we have, right? That's what we're trying to calculate. And the way in which we do it in a Bayesian framework is we take this function here, which is just our likelihood function. So this is maximum likelihood phylogenies, right? This is given our what what is the probability of our alignment given these possible different models going different models multiplied by our prior probability of different models and this is where we can incorporate a lot of our prior knowledge and understanding of the pathogen we incorporate information in the literature right what is what have other people measured the mutation rate of this pathogen in different contexts has there been substitution models that have been fitted and are specialized for the kind of substitutions we see occurring in this particular virus, right? So we can incorporate prior probabilities. We say, okay, here are some things we think are more likely than others to try and make, and that makes our inference a bit more efficient because we're more we're incorporating that prior information into the inference. 
Now, if our observed data, if the likelihoods here very much refute a strong prior we've given, we've said, you know, it's very likely to be this prior, but, you know, the observation here can majorly outweigh that. We just need more information to outweigh that. And then we have this tricky thing on the bottom that we're, what we can basically never really calculate because it's, you have to basically integrate, to calculate this, you have to integrate over all possible data sets and all possible models. So we never actually go about directly calculating that. In fact, and what we do is we only look at this posterior probability in terms of relative. So we calculate this for two different sets of models and we take the ratio of those two models to avoid having to ever calculate this tricky term at the bottom that we're not gonna touch. And so if anyone's done Bayesian inference, that's what you're doing in Monte Carlo Markov chain. When you're running those chains, you're looking at the relative improvement in posterior probability across time. So you never have to calculate this tricky thing here. However, so Bayesian inference is great, big fan of it. Uh, it's your most flexible way of doing a lot of these inferences, especially more custom and complex inferences. However, we will mostly use likelihood-based methods in the practical because they are generally a lot faster and more predictable in their outcomes. There's a bit of a, there's an art and a science to carefully fitting a Bayesian model, which is not the most amenable to a single hour practical. However, if you are very interested in these methods and you do intend to use some of these approaches in your own research or in your uh, public health work, I really recommend the Taming the Beast workshop that some of these figures are stolen from, mercilessly from. Uh, there's usually, there's one in, there's been one in BC a few times, and this is essentially a bit like the CBD IDE workshop, but entirely focused on one particular Bayesian file genetic platform, the largest, most flexible, most common one, which is BEAST. So if you want to go really deep into this, I highly recommend heading, heading that direction. Okay, so... Now we've got, we've kind of gone through what is the file dynamics approaches, what the kind of analysis we do, you know, what's that phylogeny represent, how is it sampling from the underlying process, how we can learn about the underlying process. And we've talked about some of the toolkits we actually use to, to do that learning, to try and draw those inferences. So now let's kind of get a bit more concrete and talk about some specific analyses you might end up doing or be interested in doing. And we're going to motivate this with zoonoses. I think everyone here has probably had some connection to either working directly on aspects of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic or, uh, or you know, have just been kept very aware of it by your specialties in the areas which you work. So we're going to draw on the examples of zoonoses. And so, you know, knowing when zoonoses happen is kind of key to reducing them. That's one of those key parts of pandemic prevention is knowing when the zoonoses happen. So what, and we're going to look at a few different aspects of zoonosis. So, you know, let's take the example of there's a few different things that can happen. So say we have an original reservoir here. So this is where the virus or bacteria is circulating, you know, in a in a it's endemic pop, uh, reservoir. So say bats, for example. And we can have a primary spillover event from this original reservoir into, say, humans or another animal. It's primary spillover. Now, then we saw, with COVID-19, we saw a lot of within-host transmission. So we saw uh, pathogen, we saw the evolution, and we saw, you know, a lot of novel variation being generated by the process of follow-on infections, right? It starts circulating with the humans, a lot of infections, lots of opportunities for mutations occurring. And then one, then what, one thing we observed with uh, SARS-CoV-2, as well as with other pathogens, is we can have a secondary spillover event. So from this human reservoir, we can spill over into other animals. Sorry, sorry, I just realized I've been circul circling my uh, cursor on the wrong screen, so no one has been able to see it. I apologize for that. A secondary spillover event, and that can go one of two ways, right? Either it can cause an infection in an animal uh, that represents a dead-end host. So thankfully for now, humans represent a dead-end host for H5N1. We're not seeing secondary transmission from spillover into humans so far finger fingers crossed um and why why does why does a host why can a host be a dead end host we can get either go one of two ways either it can cause no real disease and no real appreciable uh titer enough that to be able to cause easy ongoing infection 
Or it can be the other extreme where it can very rapidly kill you before you have a chance to pass it on to other people or other animals, right? So that's a dead end host. It's not ideal. We don't want to give a lot of opportunities of dead end hosts, but it's not generally a huge problem because we're not seeing this within host transmission, right? So we have spillover into an animal and we, it establishes a new reservoir with a lot of stable within host transmission occurring within that, within that new animal host. We can generate a whole bunch of new variants and new mutations. Whereas that's a problem for human health is they can then spill back into humans, cause infections there with huge implications for things like the, our ability, you know, evasion of vaccines, for example. You know, we've developed vaccines for what's circulating in humans, but suddenly we get a spillback from this entire other evolutionary regime, right? Whole different selection factors, whole different evolutionary pressures, different immune evasion. And in most cases, the spillback probably, hopefully, should not be too optimized to causing disease in humans because it's been molded by this other reservoir. But that can still cause major problems for uh, disease control, especially if, you know, that, you know, maybe it's less, it's a milder disease, but the vaccines are no longer protective against it. That can very quickly evolve, higher degrees of virulence, and so on and so forth. So, probably preaching to the choir here. Zoonoses are important. We need to be doing more about uh, prevention and preparedness in relation to zoonoses in the One Health frameworks. So knowing when zoonoses happen is key to reducing them. So how do we work out when a zoonosis has occurred? Right. Well, one of the things we want to do is we want to take a tree that's measured, you know, a phylogenetic tree that we've got the distance, the branches are proportional to evolution, to you know, mutational distance, the number of substitutions per site. Right. And we want to turn that tree into a time calibrated tree. Right. So we want to be able to work at what is the date of these nodes back in the tree. When did this occur? When did this occur? When did this occur? But we have that metadata annotated here. Right, so we see the red samples came from 2017, yellow 2013. And we see there is usually some degree of pattern and relationship between the temporal and the mutation. And so, if we can, if we have the mutation rate right, either directly from our Bayesian inference or the maximum likelihood estimate, or from a root to tip progression, so what we're doing here is we're taking the distance between the root and each of these tips. Right, that's a measure of distance. What we're measuring there, substitutions per site, and then we're plotting them against the time that sample was taken. Right, one of those key bits of contextual data that you really hope is cal is has been uh, correctly recorded and given to a degree of accuracy for this kind of analysis. So what we've got, so we've got the distances from the root to all these points, and then we can do a regression through this. Or, you know, a multi-part regression if we're seeing multiple different samples here, like multiple clock rates. And the slope of this regression line through these points is our estimate of the mutation rate, right? Because it is the regression of the number of mutations that are occurring per time, right? So 0 0.0041 per year in this case, that gives us that information. So then we can use that mutation rate uh, along with potentially any fixed points or any information we have to take our distance tree here and map it to a time calibrated tree. And so we're going we're gonna to see, see, pretty similar tree, but we now have it on a time based axis, which opens us up to being able to do a whole bunch of different analyses and try and work out, you know, when was the split between these taxa? When did we see a spillover from mostly samples infecting a certain animal to human samples? or to a secondary uh, reservoir. And we can infer much more complex and varying mutation rates using more sophisticated models, right? Um, that's what I'm saying, like, you know, often, often we're not going to end up with one nice line here where we can draw a mutation rate. We may end up with multiple, you know, there's a whole bunch of samples that clearly have this mutation rate, but maybe there'd be a whole scatter up here suggestive of a subset that has a higher mutation rate. Um, I did it again. I moved my cursor. I apologize. <laughs> um, okay, so time trees. And so what time trees let us do is let us infer the timing of unobserved events. So this is the data set we're going to use in lab practical. And what we have here is we have one of those spillover events from SARS-CoV-2 circulating in humans to some un to to basically infecting deer 
with the potential spillback into humans, right? So we see that process of circulation in deer, diversity generated in deer, and then spill back into a human case. Uh, and a spillover into mink as well. And we saw observe, also observed spillback from mink to human cases, particularly mink farmers. So if we have a time tree, if we calibrate a time tree and infer those mutation rates, what we can do is we can infer what the most likely dates were for some of these nodes in the previous tree, in this tree. So here we can say, okay, the common ancestor of all of these deer samples and this human secondary human case, the spillover back, spill back into human, occurred around May to July 2021. And we can also infer the length of this branch here is approximately a year of evolution where we weren't monitoring anything in this in this area, right? So we have a year gap between the most common ancestor of all these samples and the nearest human cases back in May to August 2020. So what does this tell us? It tells us potentially SARS-CoV-2 has spilled over into deer and been evolving unobserved for that entire time in circulating in deer or in other wildlife, sylvatic wildlife. But it tells us here we have a big gap in our surveillance, right? And a whole bunch of mutation and evolution and infection that's been happening that we have not been monitoring. So beyond, oops, sorry. Sorry, uh, a siren in the background. Um, we also often want to know where something has happened, right? So if we know we know when it's happened, we know the gaps in the observation. We also want to know where something has occurred. That's also a great way to be able to design interventions to try and prevent spillover, try and prevent secondary outbreaks. So how do we go about doing this? So we can trace sources of outbreaks using our phylogeny. So you say here, we have, you know, back to our A, B, C, D, E, F tree. And what we can do is we can annotate onto the, the tips of the tree, you know, okay, these three samples, A, B, and C, we're all from hospital one, right? We found these at hospital one, where samples D, E, and F were community samples. And this nice single grouping we see here, in a very, you know, the most parsimonious way, the simplest explanation is these likely all came from the same, these are a single, single source of introduction, right? There's been one event where we've gone from community pathogens to this hospital-based outbreak, these three samples in the hospital. They nicely group on the tree, it likely had a single source of origin. Alternatively, we might see other patterns of these tip based of these labels on the tips in terms of location. Right? We could see in hospital, so A and B are in hospital one, C is in the community, E is in the community, and F is in hospital one. Right? And again, the most parsimonious explanation of this would be two independent introductions of the pathogen into the hospitals. Right? We've got a split tree here. But how do we go about, you know, this is this is the very, you know, very simple tree, very simple scenarios. And I've said, you know, there's multiple different scenarios that could be consistent with this, right? This could be a single introduction to the hospital back here that's then had two secondary cases in the community. Right? That is a possible explanation for this pattern. Same with the other other kind of aspects of traits that we have things labeled on the tips on the tree that we're trying to infer back in the tree. So how do we go about trying to work out what is the most likely or the highest posterior probability explanation for when, where the location of certain nodes back in the tree actually were? Was it hospital? Is this a hospital node or a community node? So we can use a whole bunch of methods called continuous time Markov chains here, or, you know, Par parsimony or doll like dollar parsimony or maximum likelihood methods. And essentially what we're trying to do is look at, we have, we can set, we can have a model of those transition rates between hospital and community. And essentially every step on the tree is an opportunity to transition between those states. So every, you know, every chunk of time we can swap between being in the hospital, being in the community in this particular case. And usually we'll inform this model with priors based on, you know, known diffusion rates. So how much do things travel between these locations? How close are samples together? Um, or just, you know, a fairly flat prior that we then try and inform with our observed data. And what this gives us is a posterior probability distribution 
over the internal nodes, right? So the majority of the probability mass for this node is they have this state A, right? This ancestral state, this, this most common reason ancestor of these two samples, so say A in this case is hospital, was most likely also a hospital sample. Back here, based on the building of the tree lens here and the transition rates, you know, mod and the modeling there, this most recent common ancestor here of these two A samples and the B sample was most likely B, or in this case, say, community or Canada. And we so the same approach can be applied to all of the nodes in the tree. So we can use the continuous tiny Markov models to try and infer what the ancestral states are from these observed tip states. So these and these in this case, these observed tip states are location. And that's exactly how you know things like the origin of Zika was traced in Northeast Brazil, right? So we have all these genomes, the tips of the tree here, all these genomes, and they're associated, they were sampled in a given location, right? And what we're trying to infer is we're trying to take those tip inf that information we have about the tips. I project it backwards, color in that tree over time, take the most credible, the highest probability location of the most recent common ancestor of those tips. And you know, using the branchlets, using all those aspects of our evolutionary model. So this is what, exactly what we're seeing here. So we see, you know, this is you know Central American samples, these are Caribbean samples. And we can see as we go back in the tree, we're coloring in the most recent common ancestors as most often being Northeast Brazil, highest probability being Northeast Brazil. So this is likely the origin of Zika likely existed in his reservoir present in Northeast Brazil. So we're able to project that back through the tree. And what's nice is the same approach works for any discrete, any discrete state, as well as actually some continuous traits we can put on the tree. So we can try and work out, you know, what was the mutation in the most recent common ancestor of say, a given cluster, a given outbreak. What mutation was present? A specific mutation. So all of these are mutation A, these ones are mutation B. Back here, the most recent common ancestor of this set likely had mutation of you know, all these samples here, likely was mutation B. And all of, all of this combined was mutation A. So mutation A is the ancestral state, and this lineage here has acquired mutation B. So this can be really key for, you know, especially when we're applying epidemiological inferences on top of this, to try and work out, you know, where did where did a certain new variant come from? Where did it fit in the tree? What was the where where did that originate? So we can apply this way of projecting back into the tree to a whole bunch of different methods and analyses that we might be interested in. Okay, so that's the so we can we can we can use the we can basically we can by inferring the mutation rate, the mutation rate part of our Bayesian model, or in a likelihood context, we can infer when the ancestral nodes in the tree likely occurred. By taking a similar approach and applying that to particular traits associated with the genomes we have, we can project them back into the tree as well and try and work out what the common ancestor, all those ancestral nodes, most likely had. So what about the other epidemiological parameters? How can we go about trying to estimate them? So remember back at the beginning, one of the examples we were talking about is, you know, estimating the pop pathogen population size and structure over time, and especially projecting back into this early epidemic period where we don't have a lot of information about the cases, right? So how do we go about using the shape of the tree and probabilistic modeling on top of that to infer that ancestral population size, how many infected cases there likely were? The nice thing is we have that property of the tree being that sample from the underlying epidemic process. So the shape of the tree relates to the population size over time. So we see, you know, example example here, you know, n is 500. We tend to see, you know, relatively small population size and in infection. We tend to see this kind of ladder structure occurring, right? Lots of small variants that then die out. You know, we have a kind of a series of bottlenecks essentially happening in our population. They have some, you know, some mutations, but then it's only a small number of secondary cases. We have this kind of laddery shaped tree. On the other extreme, we have a very large population size. We see what we saw with SARS CoV 2, where we have, you know, multiple lineages being established until, you know, eventually one outcompetes the other. We have this kind of very kind of broad brush 
Blake tree occurring. So we can look at the shape of the tree and try and infer aspects to do with the population size, size and population structure of the underlying tree. There is a whole concept of effective population size here, which is kind of a function of that population size and structure. Um, so bottlenecks and things like that will mean the effective population size is smaller than they said maybe the active, actual population size. But regardless, shape of the tree tells us about the population size and structure. So how do we go about actually looking at this and inferring this? So we can use these things called coalescent processes to quantify this relationship. So this is a way of sort of projecting time, running the tree backwards through time. So say we've got a tree like this, where essentially all of these branch lengths, assuming the mutation rate is the same over the tree, are roughly the same length, right? They're being drawn from the same kind of distribution, right? This represents what is likely a constant population size over time if all these kind of lengths are the same. Alternatively here, we can see we sort of have, as we go back in the tree, we tend to have like, we have little short branches kind of occurring here. That's representative of a growing population with some long branches on the end. So why do, why do we see these shapes? Well, we can look at something called a coalescent process underneath. So a coalescent process is a relatively simple function where we're saying the probability of two of these samples in the population coalescing, joining together in the tree if we run it backwards, is one over the population size, right? So the more and more, the bigger the population, so the wider this set of boxes are, the lower the probability that any two nodes that we've actually sampled, any of these two genomes we represent, are going to coalesce into one of those ancestral nodes in the tree. The smaller population sizes, right? We have more opportunity, we have, you know, there are more higher, there's a higher probability they're going to coalesce, right? They're more likely to share a common ancestor. If we go all the way back to the root here, and there's only, you know, the G population size is one, there's been a spillover of this one particular genome group of this pathogen, they're all, they're guaranteed to coalesce the population size this small, right? So we can use this coalescent process to infer what the population size is at given times in the past. So you see here, population size increases, and our probability of coalescence is decreasing, right? So we tend to have longer branches. Constant size, we see roughly the same coalescent probability over time. And we can look at things like Tajima's D to capture that deviation from neutral change from neutral change. So we can see, you know, if we see lots of long branches towards the end, we can see probably the population size is growing over time. That coalescent probability is decreasing. And we're observing a few of those coalescent events from the things we've sampled. Neutral evolution here, everything's about the same length. Or if we see a pattern like this, where we have long branches at the back, lots of samples at the beginning, and lots of short branches at the end here, what we're seeing is basically a decreasing population size. The coalescent probability is increasing as we get down to that smaller and smaller population. So I know, again, we're covering a lot of ground in this, in this one hour ledger. This is material that, as I say, there's an entire workshop that goes into detail there. And this is whole level kind of PhDs of work, much like pretty much every ledger in the uh, Canadian Biofacts workshop. So it gives you a place to start. I'm aware this is a lot to cover, though. But I think the key thing to take away from this is just that the shape of the tree can tell you information about the underlying population size and structure. And there are things like Tajima's D and this coalescent thing that are ways we can investigate and analyze that. OK, so what's the, the last thing I promised, the last type of analysis we're going to talk about? What about some of those evolutionary forces, like selection? So this is a really key thing in evolution and in pathogen evolution. What is being selected for in the tree, in the, in the genomes, right? Are we seeing strong selection pressure towards certain phenotypes? What is the impact of, for example, if we provide vaccination? Do we see selection occurring for immune evasion and related to escaping the protection that vaccine offers? What about giving treatment with given antivirals? Are they, in, in, are they imposing a selective force which is likely to change the virus in ways that may be a problem for us? Are we seeing selection for change of host receptors? you know, to more have 
to spread better in humans, for example. So one thing we're really interested in is selection. So how do we go about detecting this and analyzing this? So kind of the classic method for looking at selection is a DNDS ratio. So this is the ratio of non-synonymous mutations that are occurring, normalized by the total number of possible non-synonymous mutations, divided by the number of synonymous mutations, again, normalized by the number of opportunities you have to have synonymous mutations. And just kind of remembering, non-synonymous being a mutation that changes the amino acid, not synonymous mutation being one that doesn't change the amino, and DNA change doesn't change the amino acid sequence. And the reason we're looking at this ratio here is we are making a fairly direct claim that this non-synonymous mutation that change the amino acid have a much bigger functional impact. Now, this isn't totally true, especially for viruses where you have a very compact genome, you're trying to make as many copies as possible. We know synonymous mutations actually have a fitness effect, but it generally is smaller than non-synonymous mutations. It's one of those kind of group fictions that we all engage in when we're using these methods. And so if we see a DNDS ratio of approximately one, that's indicative of drift occurring in the population, right? So we see, you know, DNDS, you know, we see three non-synonymous mutations normalized by the number of sites, and three synonymous mutations normalized by the number of sites. You know, it's about equal, we're having roughly equal probability of non-synonymous and non-synonymous mutations per the number of opportunities we have to have them. That's an indication of drift, right? But there's not really any strong selection being imposed on pathogen of interest. We see a lot more synonymous, non-synonymous mutations than synonymous mutations, i.e. a DNDS greater than one. That's an indication that we're seeing adaptive selection going on, a positive selection. So this may be selecting for trying to, uh, you know, evade a given immune response or better adapt to cause infections in uh, a different host. And also see the opposite here. So pure, so when a DNDS ratio is less than one, this is something we refer to as purifying or negative selection. And where this kind of can occur is when basically something has become relatively well adapted to a given host, a given state of that host, this population. And so any synonymous, non-synonymous mutation, which changes the amino acid, actually makes it less fit uh, or potentially, you know, completely removes the population. We see this purifying effect, right? We see, you know, we only see the accumulation of these synonymous mutations, which don't affect the fitness too much. So this is a relatively simple concept. Ratio of non-synonymous mutations divided by synonymous mutations gives us an idea of whether selection is occurring and the type of selection, directionality suggestion. There's a lot of challenges with this, right? Mutation rates vary over time in groups. So we need to correct this a little bit for that variation. Mutation rates also vary across the genome, right? So this is SARS-CoV-2 genome. And we see, you know, there's big spikes of how common mutations are occurring. Well, literally spikes on the spike. The number of mutations occurring, right, are not evenly uniformly distributed across the genome. Certain sites have a higher mutation rate. And then the biggest challenge with this is genomes are, at, are related to one another, right? These mutations are not independent of one another. Why is that a problem? So say we have our, ABC, our trusty ABC DEF genomes here, and we have you know, a whole bunch of synon so purple synonymous mutations, orange or non-synonymous mutations. You know, if we, you know, if we're not thinking about phylogeny, we're not thinking about things being related, we can just count up the number of mutations occurring in each of these, right? So A has two purple synonymous mutations and one non-synonymous mutation. Same with B. C has three non-synonymous and one non-synonymous. So if you just take out those numbers and tally them up, calculate DNDS, you're still you're going to mislead yourself because some of those mutations are the same mutation. Right? We're counting this non-synonymous mutation as having occurred twice, but it's only occurred once in the common ancestor of, actually, this should be down here, E and F, right? This is actually A and B up here. So we see, see here where this mutation is only occur, has only actually occurred once, but we're counting it twice if we just look at the genomes. So these mutations are non-independent. Same here. So this mutation that's present in A, B, and C has only occurred once, but it's being counted three times if we just look at the genomes. So we, 
you know, so, you know, the classic assumption in most statistical analyses is, you know, independent events, independent identically distributed, IID. And so if we don't use the phylogeny, we don't capture the dependency structure of the genomic data. This is, you know, this is a problem in other aspects as well, such as machine learning. Uh, Dr. MacArthur talked about predicting resistance. Often those predictive models are not incorporating phylogeny, right? So things that are more closely related are likely to have the same phenotype and share genes by chance that are unrelated to resistance or non-resistance. So we need to use the phylogeny to capture the dependency structure of the genomic data to correctly inform error models for things like testing for mutate for uh, ENDS and selection. So the nice thing and the great thing, the great news is, other people much smarter than me have already figured some of these problems out and developed really nice, easy to use models that you're going to use in tomorrow's lab for doing these kind of analyses. The method we're going to use tomorrow is called the Adaptive Branch Site Random Effects Likelihood, or ABSREL. What this does is test it, it tests if, is there a significant proportion of sites, so across the alignment, within the branches you've selected, with a DNDS ratio higher than one. So we're correcting for that difference in mutation rate across the genomes. We're potentially correcting for the difference in mutation rate across different parts of the tree. And we're incorporating the phylogeny into our uh, analysis and statistical testing. So we're not counting the same mutation that's occurred once multiple times. So what does this look like? So here's an example from a paper by uh, uh, Kaganya in uh, Samira Mubareka's lab, using the use of whole genome sequencing to identify low frequency mutations in SARS-CoV-2 treated with remdesivir. So what we did is take all the patients in the hospital that have been treated with remdesivir, a particular antiviral drug. And one of the things we wanted to know is, does this drug select, does this drug impose a selective force that leads to potentially new variants emerging of SARS-CoV-2? Especially in cases where we had shortened courses, so when patients have not taken the full therapy. Because we know this is a problem in things like uh, antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. So if we can take a tree and we can take, okay, here are the patients that uh, or didn't have remdesivir, and here are genomes we sequence from them, build that tree. And what we're going to do is we want to test for, is there elevated selection in the genomes we sampled from patients that are on remdesivir relative to those other genes? The good news in this case was no. But so this is this is the base of this test, right? We're testing for elevated DNDS in a significant proportion of sites in these orange branches relative to these black branches. So I promise that's the last that's the last uh, analysis we're talking about. So to give so give a summary, chance to breathe, chance to hope we'll get to, towards the end of your day. Today in this file dynamics module, we're talked about how pathogen evolution and epidemiology are intrinsically linked with one another, right? And I've shown you how phylogenies and the shape of phylogenies is based on the sampling of that underlying epidemic process which is in turn shaped by the ecology, evolution, and epidemiology of the pathogen. Showed you how we can use genomics to provide insight into the evolution and unobserved events. So we don't have case information and we don't even have ancestral genome information. We can use file dynamics and genomic information to look backwards in time to those, um, try and infer what the most likely state or highest posterior probability state is for those ancestral things. And file dynamics largely, file geography, heavily uses Bayesian models, although we are going to use likelihood models in our assignment in our lab tomorrow. And we can use these approaches to do many, many, many things, which I've given you only a very light sample of today. We can reconstruct transmission. We can infer what is the most likely transmission scenario given our observed genomic data, who most likely infected who, incorporating in a lot of those sources of variation and diversity, especially intra-host diversity. We can infer the timing and location of outbreaks and ancestral events in our tree. Where did this come from and when did it arrive? We can directly look, we can directly infer some of those key epidemiological parameters we're interested in, such as the pathogen population size and structure over time. And we can test for some of those evolutionary forces and dynamics. In this case, I've shown an example of how to test for selection, but we can also look for, th for sources like recombination. For H5N1, we can look at reassortment by comparing across segments. 
So that's if that that's that that's me done for today. Um, I think we're clearly done with lectures today. There's now an optional integrative assignment review with TAs. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to kind of throw it in the chat. We can talk about it now. Uh, if not, you are more than welcome to email me uh, or message me direct, DM me directly uh, on the CBW. Uh, thank you all for listening and persisting with the end of the day.